Hello, this is Steve McGrath, and this is the Victory Podcast. I am joined by none other than Earl the Twirl Christie. And if you're not familiar with Earl, it's been a couple of years since you played. Earl <laughs> <laughs> played from uh, in the late 60s, 66 to 69 with the New York Jets, which means that he is a member of the Super Bowl III New York Jets championship team who is celebrating their 50th year anniversary this year from winning. And that's a team that had just you know, Joe Namath, Don Hudson, Coach Eubank, all of which are in the Hall of Fame. I believe Buddy Ryan was an assistant on that team as well. Yes. And, uh, and since then, Earl, obviously you've had a full life. And, and I want to jump into how you've transitioned from being a player into getting into the different aspects of life. And uh, before we do any of that, though, I just want to thank you for taking the time today to, to talk with us. It's my pleasure and joy, I'm telling you, to talk with you. Well, you, you know, like I said, of course, we know that you were a member of that uh, championship team, Super Bowl three. You were a you know kick returner, but you also played defensive back. So I just wanted to ask you uh, the obvious. What was it like? living the Joe Namath guarantee game, the, the road to get there and all that. If you could just take it from the top, tell us about that. Uh, first of all, coming from uh, the state of Maryland, growing up to be a John Unitas and fan, because I'm, I'm from there and, uh, you know, playing in a Super Bowl, which I never played football until I went to college. So it was a great thrill playing against my hometown team and uh, uh, nobody gave us a chance of course you know with the great prediction uh, uh, we were 18 19 points underdog and uh, they, they were so bad they said we won't even pass the 50 yard line and of course I caught the opening kickoff of Super Bowl three and being in the locker room we flip the coin before we go out on the field and we just go through the ceremony after we get there and knowing that I was going to be the first person to catch the ball and try to run it back. And uh, if I fumble, it's all over, you know, we <laughs> talking today, but um, it was really awesome. And you talk about Joe guarantee the victory. I got to give you a story that a lot of people don't know about is that I had a grandmother, didn't know much about football, but she would watch it. She just knew my number. And Joe was at a meeting on Thursday, like a sports luncheon. And they were just harassing him, saying how bad we're going to be. And Joe just got mad and said, listen, I'm sick and tired of this. We're going to win. And I guarantee we're going to win. Well, he said it on Thursday. But I had a, grand, a grandmother that was a praying grandmother. And she said it on Monday. But she didn't guarantee the victory like Joe. But she said that we were going to win. And I, I'm telling you. When, when I first caught the ball and I was running, I got hit so hard, I didn't even feel it. I, I was just so hyped up on, on that game. I, I can only imagine. It's the Super Bowl, right? I, I mean, if that doesn't get the juices flowing, what will? <laughs> you're in trouble. I'm telling you, you're not breathing. But I mean, it's, it's so exciting, especially your whole family. The whole world's watching us. You know, I said, you know, normally uh, we we're on NBC. Uh, we were on NBC and we were always on national TV. But now this week they got to watch us both because the coast and the Jets are playing. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so you didn't start playing football until college. Uh, you know, Just fr from doing my research, I saw that you were quite an athlete, track and field and particularly basketball. Uh, how did you end up actually playing football? Well, I had a roommate, a college roommate, and I always make a joke when I go out and speak all over the world. And then that, uh, he said, man, Earl, you got the right size. And, and you know, we were taking our physical education classes together in college. And he said, man, you got tremendous speed and, you know, pretty decent athlete. And he said, Earl, uh, you should come out for the team. So anyhow, I went over to the locker room and and and, and, and he said, hey, uh, you lost your key or something, or you left your key? I said, no. I said, you told me I could play football. He said, oh, I was just kidding. I said, oh, come on now. So, but anyhow, that's how I really got started. When I went over to the locker room, talked to the coach, and at that time, it was uh, Skip McCain, who is now a Hall of Fame college coach. He has since then passed away. But uh, 
They gave me my uniform and everything. I mean, this is the first time I've ever put on a football uniform, okay? Now, that's in college. And, and so I saw some of the guys over at the locker laughing and smiling. I said, why are they smiling, you know? Because they knew, they heard that this is the first time I'm going to try out for football. And they were just, they were just licking their chops, man. So we went out on the field. This is true story. We went out on the field and the coach said, now, Christy, you just watch what they're doing. And this guy called, signal, set down, hut one, hut two, a 241. And guys hit him and knocked him down. And the guy said, drag him off the field. I said, good night. I see, and back in those days, they didn't have a cell phone, so I couldn't even call home. He, he said, you're watching now, right? I said, oh, wow, I can't take it out now because, I, you know, I'm an athlete, you know, regardless. I played other sports in high school. So then the next play, they hit another guy. And then they moved him off the field and start bleeding. He said, okay, Christy, this is your turn. And literally, they called the same play. I closed my eyes and I was running with the football and I was running over people. And the coach said, if you'd open your eyes, you may be going further. But that's how I really started my first time at running back at Maryland Eastern Shore called University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously you went a long way from that play to making the Jets. So how how did you ultimately get in a position where the Jets even knew who you were? Was it just through, you know, the scouting process? Did you get drafted? Oh, well, I thought you'd never ask. No, they came to see a guy by the name of Emerson Boozer, okay? He came down. That was Walt Michaels. In fact, he's the only coach that right now is still living that we had. Uh, the other coaches have passed away. And, of course, this year, uh, Buddy Ron just recently passed away not too long ago. But anyhow, he came down to see Emerson Boozer. And he saw this kid, number 21, in college running kickoffs back for touchdowns and everything. So guess what? He said, hey, I'm going to get the Emerson Boozer. We're going to draft Emerson Boozer, and hopefully we get him on the Jets because they had the war between the AFL and the NFL. And so anyhow, I, he, he signed me to a contract. We went to New York. We signed a contract, free agent contract. And uh, that's where I got my start from, uh, Walt Michaels. And um, – to run kickoffs and punt return. And I was uh, in college, a wide receiver and a running back. That's awesome. So, yeah, I believe I saw that there were five guys from University of Maryland Eastern Shore that were playing in that Super Bowl game. And that for, for such a small school, that is just incredible. Well, 800 students, counting young ladies, young men, Chickens, cows, of course, we were out to cultural school, <laughs> anyhow. And uh, 800 students, two on the coats, that was James Duncan and Charlie Stooks. And uh, they were our quarterback, and they did play some defensive back. But Emerson Booz and myself, we used to beat them up in practice every day. So, you know, when we're going into the Super Bowl, we said, oh, come on, we've got a chance to win. Johnny Sample was the only one that was before us and Emerson Booz and myself. And it was four of us that played together. So you can imagine more than any college in America from that little small school. And uh, it, it just was a great joy because the the students at our school didn't know who to, you know, the, the root for, but most of them, they said they rooted for us, okay? <laughs> because we were the young guys on the block with your neighbor. <laughs> so, uh, I just wanted to ask again, uh, just not, uh, of course, you know, there's the game and everyone knows that Joe guaranteed it, but, you know, what was it like having, you know, Joe as a teammate? You know, he's the best Jets quarterback to you know, ever suit up for them. What was it about him and even Don Hudson, who's one of the best receivers? Don uh, Maynard. Yeah, Don Maynard. So I'm so sorry. Um, yeah. What was it about them that they were able to – you know, just playing alongside of them, what did you see that made them so special in their time that just so much better than their peers? Well, see, Joe Namath had a lot of charisma. That's first of all. But he is a better person than he is a football player. And he was a great football player. He brought the guys together from the South. You got to remember, this was like the 60s. 
and people from different colleges that have never played together in, 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 in cultural situation and he phenomenal and with confidence you know uh, you know he would get in the huddle and we call and at Super Bowl three we called 80 to 90 percent of the plays from the line of scrimmage and I have to say that we view Frank Coach John Unitas and he coached Joe Namath. So those are two great quarterbacks. But he said we had the most intelligent football team that he's ever coached. We would never miss a blitz. And Joe would get in the huddle and says, check with me. That means, you know, they would check blitz, Boozer, Matt Snell, tremendous blockers and everything. So the, the bottom line is that the, the intelligence of the football player and the confidence that Joe Namath had, I'm telling you, it was unbelievable. I mean, he was like a gunslinger. And, and with those bare knees, he was awesome. But he could throw the football. And, and I remember talking to people like Dan Marina. He wasn't not a bad football player, but that release that he would throw and that confidence that he would bring the team together. I mean, you he, he was just an awesome person. And uh, and uh, we're still, I can't believe it, after 50 some years, we, uh, you know, we, I've been knowing him and we just recently had our 50 year winning anniversary of Super Bowl three. Right, right. Yeah, so it, it, it's crazy. Uh, but you, you know, so you were, you played three years you know, with the Jets. And uh, of course, Super Bowl three is the obvious thing on paper that most people can point to and saying like oh wow you did that but when you look at, at your football career as a player is there any one moment in particular that stands out to you as what was your favorite time or experience outside of the super bowl well believe it or not you know the you know the most uh, time that we really loved and enjoyed was when we played the oakland raiders and beat them in the american league championship i mean you should have seen grown men crying because this was the first time really basically winning something on that level to go to the Super Bowl. And, and, and our coaches believe if we beat the Oakland Raiders, we're gonna become world champion. Because when, when we look in that film, we knew that the Oakland Raiders, we thought they had a better team on paper. And plus we, uh, our tight end, Pete Lambert said, we better stop looking at the film after we beat the Raiders that we may get overconfidence because they, it, it just matches our game because they would do a lot of blitzing and they were an awesome football team. And they only lost one game that year mm -hmm. and that was against Cleveland Browns and Cleveland. And the next time they beat Cleveland 34 to nothing. So what we would do, they would blitz a lot and we would check off and they, and, and they thought that was the play. And then we'd double check and they would be in the wrong position. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 just like how the Colts had you know, Unitas and had an incredible team that you know full of future Hall of Famers, the Raiders at that time too are just so stocked with talent. And I, it's so weird to the fan today to think about the fact that you had to win the AFL championship before you could go to the Super Bowl. You know, not that it's you know, of course today there's the AFC and the NFC <laughs> championships, but back then that's just not how it was structured. Right. No question about it, man. I, I'm telling you, it, it was amazing. And, and you know, of course, we only lost three games. And I, I, you haven't asked me about the good old Hardy game. But the, <laughs> I was, I was uh, getting to it. But that's OK. But anyhow, and, and actually, this shows you how mental the game is, because we thought we were going to go out. And at that time, uh, the Buffalo Bills just had a bad record, and we just thought we were going to step out on the field and beat them just like when we played against Denver. But not the case, man, because, you know, you got to bring your game every Sunday and every Sunday or whatever day you're playing that one team can beat another. Yeah, that's saying any given Sunday. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the Heidi game that you mentioned, for <laughs> all the, the listeners out there that are closer to my age, the Heidi game, I think, sets the precedent for what every uh, broadcast station does today, which is it does not matter if the game is over. It is always going to play that game to the end because uh, back then, was it NBC that was? Uh, That's yeah. right, NBC. Yeah, NBC was really promoting this sh uh, movie or a show called Heidi, Hi. and it, it cut your game short, a very close game with the Raiders that everyone was watching. And they just jumped to the movie when there was just a few minutes left in the game. 
And it just mass hysteria. Everyone was pissed that they couldn't see the end of the game. And I, I'm pretty sure that that's why today it never happens. It's a rule that those games always get aired to the end. Well, I'll just give you a little brief story what happened. It literally burned the circuits, circuits out at NBC. But here, I had a friend of mine that, you know, he had to take care of some on that day. And he was driving through the Harlem Tunnel. And, uh, and he, the Jets were winning. And when he got through the tunnel, and he said, the uh, Oakland Raiders beat the New York Jets. And he almost wrecked his car, man. He couldn't believe it, man. It was unbelievable. I mean, they literally scored two touchdowns in nine seconds. And I got to tell you what happened. They said I fumbled the ball, which you have to give me a credit for fumbling because my own teammate knocked the ball out of my hand. And here the, the defense was out there. And, uh, and the ball's going in the end zone, and they fell in, on it in within nine seconds because they had just scored a touchdown against one of our rookie players and then came back, and um, my own teammate knocked the ball out of my hand. It took me 20 years to talk about it. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> but you know what? All that matters is the end result of that season, right? So maybe that had to happen for you yes. guys to ultimately go on and beat them, just well, like how – the Browns beat them, and then they came back and crushed the Browns. You know, right. to have that moment gives you that mental edge to come back and win. That That's correct. No question about it. And as we said, the, the game is mental. And you, can you imagine as the physical aspect of pro football, you know? And I always tell people the game hasn't changed in the sense that it's still blocking and tackling. But the mental aspect of the game is, is tremendous. And, of course, we've changed some of the rules today. But, you know. <laughs> yeah. When you talk about you know, Joe being able to go to the line and 90% of the plays he was kind of calling at the line of scrimmage, you know, that – you know, the mental part of the game, when you were playing, it seems like it fell a lot on the quarterback, whereas today I feel like there's so much of it that there's just so much technology and coaches and all this, you know, training that watching film, that everyone's trying to do so much that the mental part of the game, I feel like, has shifted from being on one person to now everyone is doing their best to know everything and you get guys almost stepping on each other's toes, whether it's the coach on the offensive coordinator, on the quarterback coach to the quarterback, and who's going to give freedom to do what? Steve, you're absolutely right. It, it is so technical, everybody. And that's the key factor because uh, that's why the Tom Brady's and, you know, uh, the Peyton Manning's when he played and the, they, they're old school quarterbacks where they read and then the receiver has to know. The offensive line, uh, the center may get up and call a flocking scheme right at the last minute, depending on the defense that they're going against. So it's like a chess game, and no question about it. And and sometimes if you're not studying, they'll really, you know, really bog you down. But uh, it's amazing how uh, how awesome it is and a lot of studying. That's the key factor. Definitely. Yeah. You know, I, I did want to ask, though, before we start talking about, you know, what's going on more recently with the NFL, you know, you're, you're still very much a young man by the time you've played your last football game. I, I think you played 30 career games. So mm -hmm. I, w I wanted to ask you, you know, as a young man, how do you deal with my football career, which, which is pretty, you know, you only started in college, so it might have only been, you know, five, six years of your life. But how did you go from that? <laughs> turn the page and I, you know, since I believe it's 1971, you've been involved in, in broadcasting in different things. Yeah. So you've been near sports, but how did you navigate that those first few years of, you know, what do I do with the rest of my life? Well, first of all, I'm so grateful that I had parents and especially my grandmother who raised me as a kid to build a great foundation. And we'll get into that part too about my spiritual aspects of the game, because it's all about that, my upbringing, to respect people, to have integrity. Uh, I went to college to become a physical education teacher. I went there to be a teacher, which is one of the greatest moments of my life, working with young people. But uh, the important thing about that, it gave me the opportunity to make adjustments. I've never been scared of working hard and working smart. 
You know, my parents taught me responsibility. And I had some great uncles that were role models. And that's so important. Because like you said, off the field is as important as on the field. So prepare myself. So I, I was really ready for that. And and a lot of times that's a tough adjustment for a lot of young people, you know. And nowadays they're getting paid a lot of money, but even with that, they still have to say, what do I do after this short period? It's just a stepping stone because injuries and all those things play an important factor. And uh, after that, I was very blessed too to play professional show basketball. So, you know, I, I was a basketball player in high school and uh, I made that transition. And that's a tough transition. A lot of people, when you've been doing something and a lot of time people say, why don't this person retire? And they, it's hard to give up something that you love and enjoyed and been a part of your whole life. But I, I'm so uh, grateful that my, my college prepared me really because of the coaches that I had they taught some of the classes and they made sure that you got the right work and have great responsibility. And that is so important to have balance in your life. Absolutely. So you, you know, just looking back at some of the, the notes of, you know, your life after football, you've been involved as an educator, as you've said, you've been involved with uh, being a, a on-air personality talent that talks about the game, whether it's broadcasting or just commentating. You know, uh, the Earl Christie Sports Network that uh, has its own YouTube channel. I was checking it out. I, I mean, as recently as this year, you're talking to uh, players on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in, in the New York Jets. So you have actively been involved, you know, in the sports community for, <laughs> for 50 years. But beyond that, you know, you have the educational piece. You have, of course, your your spiritual work. That's you know, a huge part of what you know what I want to get into. How did you go about balancing all that and finding those different different avenues? Well, you know, I surround myself with people. You know, I always tell even young people, don't let your friends pick you. You pick your friends, and that's that's so important because I found out through my teaching experience. A lot of young people and even adults, we have peer pressure. If we have somebody in our neighborhood buying a yacht, well, the neighbor might want to buy a yacht or whatever, a new car, whatever. And we and we find out that because of through my teaching and, and, and training that, you know, vanity things are nice, but they only last for a minute. It, it's, it's about building that strong foundation, appreciating each other and, and and you're gonna get to the topic that I love so much and then that that word love that really I, I I'm more happier now and more joyful than I've ever been in my life. And although we you know we go through trials and tribulations and we're gonna do that the rest of our life. But I, I'm just so grateful that I surrounded myself with people that care about you. And I always have a saying people don't care how much you know they want to know how much you care. And and I've been blessed to be with, with great people, just like my, my wife and friends. I mean, it, it is so amazing. And that's what it's all about. Association, bring forth assimilation. <laughs> that's It's such a great quote. And it's on earlchristie.com, which is why I was going to specifically bring it up. But you beat me so much. I, I think it, it's so accurate. It, it hits the nail right on the head for what you know, life is, is really about and you know just the, the fact that you've been able to find that and live that uh, I, I think is a, a testament to you know, why you're so happy because it, it is about those deeper connections and going beyond the, the, the vanity of everything right yeah it's all about family and you know and, and uh, uh, together that was joyful even with 60 70 or 80 thousand people watching you but it's amazing when you have people in your family that could come to a game and everything and, and just tell you the whole story. It's just amazing. Yeah, it's just amazing. So uh, I, I'm just so grateful for that opportunity to really share uh, with people and family members. And, and you know, people like yourself, you, you make, I mean, 
I could just see the joy at a young age like you, man, doing something that you love to do and you do it well because you care about people. And that's what it's all about. And I, I truly believe with all the chaos that we may have in this world, we, we're going to get to the fat mountaintop because it's going to take each individual. That is the key factor of us winning together. Yeah. Well, it, thank you. I, I just I, I enjoy stories from from people who have lived it and have perspective perspective that I do not have. And I think that I can personally learn from it. But everyone that watches or listens, well, e even if it's just one or two things that they take away from this conversation that they can use to improve their life or think about something a little differently than uh, that. I feel like I, I've done my job to try to you know promote good and have a positive influence. Yeah, it, it, it's no doubt about it. And like I said earlier, association brings forth assimilation and align yourself. You know what I'm saying? Respect one another. And I always say respect starts with yourself. So, you know, you, you got you got a joy. You got to bring it to yourself. You got to feel good about yourself. You got to have good self-esteem. And, 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 and this starts with people being surrounded with great people and great persons. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, just a lot of what you're saying to me ties into a, another aspect of, you know, who Earl Christie is, which is the ordained minister who had who operates, you know, talk about Christ, talking about Christ. So how has your faith acted as a pillar for you throughout your life? But, you know, particularly now as, you know, something that you spend time in to you know put together a show and have a Facebook page. Well, you know, what's so awesome, you know, uh, I get a chance to talk to high school, college kids, and, and, and even the, the New York Jets in their chapel. I, I love it so much. And you'd be surprised how some of these guys have a good foundation. And, and when you go in the chapel and you, and you always say, and then even if you tell people, say, where did you get your talent from? You got it from the creator of the world. You got it from God. That's where your talent, whether it's, whether it's business, or whether it's sports or what have you, you got that talent. And you can't really argue that point because you're, it's a blessing to have that. But the bottom line, too, is, is work hard and work smart. And, and, and that foundation of, 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 of loving the Lord and, and sharing that word because if you really look at I think the greatest book ever written is the Holy Bible the answers are in there you can learn from that and, and you know just like old saying go when two disciples went out they were selling this and they still selling the people are still after certain thousands of years and, 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 and it just gives me such joy I mean and peace and even when we're going through trials and tribulations, uh, uh, I, I have uh, some sayings, you know, can I just repeat this? I just wanted to share this real quick. Of okay. course. Faith is not believing that God can. It's knowing that God will. The will of God will never lead you where the grace of God cannot keep you. Life is fragile. Handle it with prayer. With God, all things are possible. And that's the attitude that we have. And that word attitude, I love it because you know what it says? It says your attitude will take you to your altitude. It will take you as high as you want to go. When I wake up in the morning, I'm just thankful that I'm breathing. I got another chance. I'm 75 years old, but I'm going on 25. But I, <laughs> It I, sounds I, like it. I'm thankful and grateful, you know, and when you see other people, around the world and you share with people. There's a lot of good people in the world that give and, and, and do those things. And, and it just makes me feel good. And, and then I look when I've been so blessed to travel all the world and I look and I see certain types of tragedy, young people, you know, starving or, or asking for food. It, 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 it just breaks my heart. And sometimes when I just say to myself, I'm, I've been so blessed and a shame on me when I'll be complaining if I don't have this or that or materialistic. And we find out right now that that doesn't truly make you happy. It's all about balance in your life. And that's what my faith does for me. Absolutely. It, just you know, listening to you talk about it, you know, it, it fills me and anyone that I'm listening to it, I'm, I'm sure with just you, you can feel the passion. It, it's tangible, even though you can't hold it. It it definitely is a huge difference in, in everyone's lives. It, you know, to not have it is just a massive void. 
Oh boy, I'm telling you, Steve, you're awesome, man. To be a young man, you 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 hit that nail right on the head. Exactly. I mean, just try just to see how it is. You know what I'm saying? I don't care who you are. You believe in something. You see what I'm saying? That's the key. And that's that's the joy that I have. You know what I'm saying? I just want to share that with people, man. Each and every day, like we said earlier, we're going to go through trials and tribulations, but I can go through it with my faith and that foundation. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I just I wanted to to pivot just for a second because I, I did want to ask you because, you know, knowing your perspective and knowing just your outlook in general, um, how do you feel when you look at other guys that are, you know, around your age who have played and you, whether it's, you know, I, not that it has to be lack of faith, but just mentally or physically, they're, they're just not doing as well as you are. Do you, do you think that the NFL should be doing more to help retired guys with better benefits or, or health care? Man, did you, I mean, you're on target, man. I'm telling you, that's a great question because people have no idea how the adjustment from that, you know, they'll say, oh, they made all that money. All the people don't make all that money, okay? You no one did in the, the 60s, no 70s, 80s. I mean. No, no, no doubt, and especially us at that time. And, you know, I, I, I really think they should try to do more, and especially with the concussion thing. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, and, and, and even when John United went to his grave, uh, a lot of times they – the, the pension, it was unbelievable. Nothing, nothing. You know what I'm saying? And and, and those are some of the people that we helped to build the game. And I think oh, yeah. we take care of everybody across the board. And and we're happy for the guys who do well, the, the present guys. But they don't be fair to everybody. And, 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 and it's a shame because I've lost a lot of teammates uh, uh, from dementia and all those type of things. And they do that, you know, take care of the whole spectrum of it. And that's what it's all about because we, we are doing well in football because it's all about the fans. It's all about the sponsorship. And we're grateful for that. But we need to be fair towards all the persons and everything because it's, it's amazing that we, we should really work hard towards helping each other because that's the people that build the game. We can't forget about the ones that help make this game great as it is today. Absolutely. And I think it was Eric Dickerson was the first Hall of Famer that I saw speak about the lack of benefit, particularly as it regards to health care. Oh. But when we had Willie Rofe on, uh, he was a hundred percent in support of you know having Hall of Fame players boycott Hall of Fame events in the future, particularly as it's getting ready to celebrate an anniversary in a year or two, uh, because so many guys that are out of the game don't have really what should be you know pretty basic elements of getting taken care of. And when you consider, like you said, the game was built off the backs of these guys and. If you just look at the revenue and all the money that's getting made today, there's no excuse for not being able to have that covered because we know the money is there. No question about it. And you know what really, if you really bring things down to perspective, what about our soldiers? It hurts and breaks my heart when I see a homeless soldier and here fighting for our country, fighting for our freedom out there. Come on, we can do better than that. We can do that better than that. And, you know, and, and that that's just a reminder with that. You know what I'm saying? But it's amazing. And, and, and you know, playing football, not, yeah, you got a choice. But it's almost like running into uh, having a car accident almost every time you get hit. You know, because these guys are big and fast and strong. It's just amazing. Yeah, I mean, you know, you got broken fingers. I had a broken jaw. And, you know, sometimes when it gets cold, <laughs> That's why I'm so glad I live in Florida. <laughs> it makes life a little easy. But, it, you know, it's a rough sport and everything. And you, you would kind of mention it, but I did want to specifically ask, like, are, are you or to what extent are you concerned about CTE, if not for yourself, for just people that you know that have played the game? Well, well, you know, I'm, I'm a little concerned, you know, you know, because they always talk about, 
the kids, I, I think we, we try to get better safety equipment that would happen and, and things of that nature. Yeah, I'm concerned, uh, uh, you know, we, we're blessed, like you said, it, it's just concussions and things of that nature. I, I, I don't think the kids should uh, not play uh, football, you know, because we always talk about them that they're going to have a permanent damage. Now, even in basketball, you can have certain things, you know, running up and down the court, you know. Unfortunately, the body's not really made for that, but I still think that we should have sports because it's, it teaches you other things, you know. Unfortunately, the physical aspects, sometimes you can pay. But I, I think if you teach the right technique, because that's an important part, too, course of injuries because when coaches are teaching you to hit with your head you know as a young age that may be a difference and and you know not a knock against some people that are volunteer to coach but you need good coaches and need good ways of teaching you the proper technique of, of, of tackling or what have you yeah the technique is so important um and especially you see the rule changes now at, in the nfl with the such a, a small amount of hitting, you know, violent hitting, I should say, compared yeah. to what, what the league was, you know, five years ago, let alone 10 or, or you know, years past when you had guys like Jack Tatum just lighting it up. But hopefully, you know, as much as it, it makes the game less exciting to an extent, hopefully that trickles down and, uh, you know, we will see less men dealing with these injuries later on in life just from the repetitive – blunt force trauma of going through, you know, what could be 20 years of you know, collisions. Right. Mini, mini car accidents, as you said. Oh, yeah. Good night. Yeah, it, it's amazing because, like you said, you, you run fast and you make a collision like that. It really pays the dividends. I, I, I can remember one time I got hit so hard, I couldn't find the ground. I was praying, please let me fall, man. They were hitting me both ways. And you know, <laughs> they call it suicide, punt return and kickoff return, especially punt return. <laughs> Not for the faint of heart. No, <laughs> you got to have a lot of heart. Uh, you know, I, I did, you know, as we're uh, getting close to wrapping this up, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, you've lived such a, a full life. What advice would you give to an 18 year old that was, you know, looking to pursue football as, uh, you know, trying to play in college or play in the NFL? What advice, whether it be on how to be a professional as a, an athlete and then just sort of life advice, you know, what, what would you say to someone? Okay, for, first of all, never stop dreaming, okay? So, secondly, you must take responsibility for things that you do in life. And what I'm saying is that try to be the best person that you can be, be respectful, uh, be honest, show honesty, show integrity, show that you care about people. It's, it's not just only about making money or fame. To be a great human being, and that, that's being kind to one another, and, and and those type of things when you go through life, and 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 show people that you appreciate one another. That's why it's so important with a good foundation. And uh, I always say, uh, uh, when you cease to learn, you cease to live. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever you go into, work hard at it and work smart, because a lot of times. Even in the uh, NFL today, some guys are not in the best of shape. And if you're not in the best of shape, that can cause injuries too. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I, I remember back in the day when we were playing, we went 60 minutes. Can you imagine? And the guy, I mean, you know, I don't knock it, but a guy run about 20, 30 yards and then run to the sideline. Man, I didn't want to come out of no game. I want to stay in the game. You see, you see what the difference? And, 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 uh, Nowadays, they, they do have great uh, training facilities, and they try to train them all around the year, but they still, uh, you know, the guys with over 300 pounds, and whether they consider that being obesity, you know, unless you got muscles on top of that. But I, I think being in great condition, because the exercise and all that is good for the mental aspect of you as a human being. And, you know, and not put the wrong stuff into your body. And I, I'm blessed today. I never drank, never tried to drink or use drugs. You see what I'm saying? So we've had some issues with those things. And only because 
the pain, you know, and sometimes people would take legal pain things because of the pain was so the thing. So it, it, it just so many things that you got to really do, maybe small things to try to make your career or make yourself more healthy. And that's important, uh, being in great shape and, and, and taking in the right uh, foods and what have you. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. It, out of just those small decisions that you can make, you know, every time you have the decision, it's, you know, do the, the smart, you know, maybe more conservative instead of, you know, pushing too far and, you know, that should amount to something when it's all said and done. Well, you hear the key word. It's, I always tell you, there's not such thing as bad people or bad things. It's making bad choices, making good decisions. That is so important. And we know right from wrong, making good decisions. I, I, I remember teaching school and the, all the teachers would put the rules up and everything. I just put up there, do the right thing. <laughs> Make the right choices and you're going to be okay. I like that. You know, I feel like when there's rules, you can tempt people to break the rules. But when you make people take ownership of their own decisions, then they actually have to own up to what they are doing. And then they are more likely to see the faults in their way of thinking, or they'll take pride in what they did. Man, you got a lot of wisdom as being a young man, man. That's all right. It's going to get better and better as we continue on the journey, because that's what we're all about. We're on the journey. We're going to have our testimony. And you're absolutely right. And boy, I mean, when you're making good decisions, and better things happen. There's no question about it. Absolutely. Well, Earl, the last hurdle that I have for you is what we call the gauntlet. It's this quick few questions I have to ask you, and I just want you to give me your knee-jerk reaction. Okay. When it comes to football, what is most important, having the number one offense or the number one defense? Oh, you know, of course, if I, you already know that, Nancy. You got to have the number one defense because defense wins championships. There's no question about it. And, of course, that people may not understand all the aspects, but field goal kicking is defense, okay? That's on the defensive side. Punt return and kickoff return is on the defensive side. But, yeah, stopping people. If they don't score, they can't beat you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so this might be splitting hairs, but which would you prefer, having a punt return for a touchdown or a kick return for a touchdown? Yeah, that uh, kick off. Yeah. Uh, I say that seven yards in my leg. Hit my feet and trip and still going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you make a tough, you know what I mean? You can really run into you, but I'd rather run a kickoff than a punt return. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, when you look back at everyone who's played or coached, you know, from Super Bowl three all the way to the guys and coaches of today, is there any one coach or player that you would have really liked the opportunity to have played under or played with? That they, they, they played under or played with? Oh, I, of course, you got to throw out Vince Lombardi. And believe it or not, playing against one of the uh, – uh, uh, Don Shula is one of the greatest coaches to ever coach. And, of course, he played in the league too for some time. But, uh, yeah, Vince Lombardi, I, 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 just, I, I just get pumped up. And, of course, I didn't play for – a non uh, Hall of Fame coach called Wee Eubank, and I played the game. Uh, played with uh, uh, in college, uh, Skip McCain, another Hall of Fame for college coach, and I, my roommate uh, Billy Joe, was a, a coach after he uh, he left uh, pro football, and he's a college Hall of Fame. So I've been hanging around with some college Hall of Fame mm -hmm. coaches all my yeah. career. And my high school coach, there's no question about it, William Clark was like a father figure to me. What a great human being. And, uh, you know, of course, a lot of them have passed and going on, but what a, what an op opportunity. I have been so blessed to have the opportunity. That was probably the greatest thing to teach you about character, about life. That is so important because that's the strong foundation that you can live on the rest of your life. Absolutely. And I have one last question for you. 
which is more important in winning? Is it the players or the scheme? Oh, I think uh, the players, they're working together in, in, in peace and harmony. I mean, that's part of the situation. But uh, each player picking up each uh, some Every day you don't feel like going that way, you know. But I always say don't take a play off. We work together in peace and harmony because that's what it does. And everybody does their job. And I have to give Belichick some credit because he has one of the best system. And when you think about the different coaches that win, that system is important too. But but uh, like you said, you, you got to have the third bridge. You just can't have the mothers either. So I think it works in conjunction with each other, really. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Um, well, Earl, thank you so much for taking the time to impart your wisdom upon us and, and you know run us through everything. It, it was awesome, and we'll definitely have to do this again sometime. Oh, I'm, good, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear it. You know, yeah. for our listeners, earlchristie.com is where you need to go to learn more about Earl's life. You can get to his sports network that's on there. And also uh, learn a little bit more on the, the faith side. Uh, you've linked to some of your other work of talking to Christ. And, yeah, talk about uh, Christ. Talk, I'm sorry, talk about Christ. That's uh, what I, you said. It, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Earl, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it. And